As a major research institution, Arizona State University offers the most online bachelor's degree programs, along with world-class faculty and dedicated support. Discover why ASU is ranked number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Tap to learn more. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thanks so much for listening. As always, be sure you check out RealLifePharmacology.com. Snag your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great little uh, study guide reference uh, for those folks maybe going through pharmacology classes or uh, if you've been out in practice for a while and just want a little refresher, uh, make sure you're staying up to date. Definitely a cool little resource to to check out and it's free, absolutely free for subscribing. All right, so let's talk about the uh, drug of the day today. Medication is cyanocobalamin, which is vitamin B12. Now, some may not consider this a a medication per se, since it is a a supplement and a a nutritional intake type of thing. Um, But I do, and and, you know the the reason being um, is that we certainly can dose it, um, and obviously it can be used to treat uh, deficiency. And there are a bunch of medications or a few medications uh, that I definitely look out for when I see an order for B12. And I'll talk about that uh, as I wrap up the podcast later in in drug interactions for sure. So what is vitamin B12 used for? What's it good for in the body? Um, The most common indication I would say I see in practice is pernicious anemia. Now what is, you know, pernicious anemia compared to, you know, generalized anemia? Well, pernicious anemia specifically uh, involves uh, lack or low amounts of intrinsic factor. Now, what's intrinsic factor? Well, intrinsic factor aids in the absorption or is necessary for gut absorption of B12. So, in patients that don't have this intrinsic factor, odds are likely they're not getting enough B12 in their diet through their food because they can't absorb it that well. Uh, through the gut because they don't have uh, this in- intrinsic factor or an inadequate amount of intrinsic factor. So long story short, these are the patients that you're likely going to see on um, injectable uh, once monthly B12 in- injections. Okay, So those with vitamin B12 deficiency uh, due to pernicious anemia, likely going to be a lifelong um, administration of, of that, that B12 by the uh, injectable route. Now, there is a, a nasal route uh, available as well um, that could potentially um, be utilized to, to substitute that. At, at this time, I believe it's way, way more expensive. Uh, don't quote me on that, but um, uh, last I, I checked, I believe it was way uh, more expensive than the injectable, but um, something to potentially look into if you've got a patient that uh, absolutely will not, you know, do injections or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so anyway, uh, that's pernicious anemia. Um, one of the, uh, you know, complications of B12 deficiency uh, is obviously those symptoms of, of anemia fatigue. You know, you get that kind of pale looking skin, uh, just tired all the time, that type of thing. Uh, other uh, potential complications uh, that I've seen from B12 deficiency. Uh, Neuropathy uh, can happen with B12 deficiency. So when I see a new order for, you know, gabapentin or pregabalin, um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is, is this a drug-induced neuropathy or is this a uh, deficiency-induced neuropathy where maybe that B12 deficiency is caused by another medication? Uh, in my geriatric patient population, um, 
if B12 deficiency is severe enough, it could lead to um, cognitive changes, and this can be uh, permanent in, in some cases too. So um, definitely keep, keep that in mind, and often uh, in a patient that uh, is experiencing you know, new memory lapses, I'll see providers order um, you know, B12 with TSH, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, lab work. So um, definitely an important thing to, to think about there. Uh, there is a, another term I, I wanted to mention associated with anemia, and you'll often hear the term megaloblastic anemia, and that basically refers to the size of the red blood cells. Uh, they actually uh, become larger, and you'll see that in the labs. You'll see an elevated um, MCV, and B12 is one of the possible diagnoses uh, from an elevated uh, MCV. Another supplement I'm not going to talk about today, but folic acid um, can cause megaloblastic anemia as well. And then iron is typically considered uh, to cause more of a microcytic uh, anemia. All right, so let's talk about some uh, disease states where B12 supplementation um, may, be, may be indicated or, or might be a good reason why we would, would need supplementation. So... Um, types of inflammatory bowel disease where maybe our absorption um, isn't that good, such as Crohn's, for example. Uh, gastric bypass surgery where we've you know, actually maybe removed or bypassed uh, certain areas of the, the gut there. Uh, we may have a reduced absorption uh, through the gut of, of uh, B12 there. Uh, alcoholism. Um, you know, obviously patients with, you know, eating disorders or they're severely malnourished. Um, again, maybe some of those dementia patients that um, aren't eating well or they forget to eat. Um, those are, are types of situations where um, chronic B12 supplementation may be indicated, uh, as well as the, the pernicious anemia, which I mentioned before there too. Uh, lab monitoring. So, you know, usual B12 levels, um, 150 to up to 900 is considered normal. That's picograms per mil. Um, I've seen some labs, I think, report out a, a lower end of, of like 200. Um, so that, that target and where we want that level to be um, might be a little bit variable based upon uh, what the, the patient has going on. Um, for instance, we may target a little higher level if they've had you know, gastric surgeries, or we know they're at risk or prone um, to not getting much absorption through the gut and through their uh, dietary intake. So again, that kind of target goal can vary a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, the ballpark normal lab is, you know, low end is, is 150 to, to 200, somewhere in, in that range. Uh, administration, I think I kind of alluded to that a little bit. Um, you know, particularly with pernicious anemia or gut problems, we're not going to get adequate absorption. So that's where you're going to often see um, the uh, sub-QIM uh, injections of, of B12. Uh, oral absorption can be variable. And so if a patient has significant B12 deficiency, uh, we're likely going to uh, try to avoid oral just because, you know, we may not be 100% sure that we're, we're getting adequate absorption. Now, if somebody's kind of borderline, that type of thing, uh, you know, it, it might be, you know, and they don't really have any symptoms or anything, um, that might be a situation where maybe we do start oral and, and kind of watch the, the B12 level and obviously monitor them clinically uh, for any symptoms of B12 uh, deficiency there. All right, so let's take a quick break, and I will finish up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study materials like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, MTM, uh, NAPLEX exam, definitely go check out meded101.com store. If you're another healthcare provider just looking for some practice pearls, uh, maybe a, a book to kind of help you know, stimulate your thought process on how to manage and deal with medications. Uh, again, we've got links to Amazon books. Uh, there's a free Audible book promotion you can take advantage of as, as well uh, if you've never had an Audible book in the past. Uh, so definitely go check out all those resources. Um, any, you know, financial support there is, is going to help with the, uh, keep producing the podcast and, and uh, help keep it free and educational. 
uh, for all to enjoy and, and benefit from. All right, so let's take a peek at drug interactions. Now, vitamin B12 itself isn't typically going to cause any issues with, you know, other medications for the most part. And if you think about it, it's like, well, you know, it's in your diet, it's in food. And, and so it, it's like, you know, the odds of it, it causing a lot of issues with a lot of medications is uh, pretty low there. Um, however, I did want to touch on medications that affect B12 because there are actually some really, really common drugs that can lower B12 levels and we should be aware of this. So the first one's a diabetes medication, um, metformin. One of the most commonly used first-line medications for type 2 diabetes, um, metformin can actually lower B12 levels. So in a patient that has diabetes, they say they're reporting neuropathy. Well, it could be diabetic neuropathy. That's a, a very plausible um, concern. Um, but it also, if they're on metformin, uh, it also could be related to B12 deficiency. So again, very, very important that we uh, think about that and make sure that we're monitoring uh, for that risk with metformin. Uh, another really uh, common class, I guess a generalized class, is uh, antacid type medications and more specifically uh, PPIs and, and H2 blockers. So your, you know, omeprazole is probably the most common, you know, PPI. Famotidine is a common H2 blocker. Um, these drugs actually have been associated with B12 deficiency. So in anybody that's obviously displaying uh, B12 deficiency symptoms, I'm going to take a look at that med list and say, hey, what are we on that PPI for? What are we on that H2 blocker for? Um, it may absolutely be necessary. They may have, you know, GI bleeding issues or something like that. Um, but it's a good time to stop and take a look and say, hey, you know, do they really need uh, this antacid therapy long term? Or can we start to try to taper down on that, which may help us avoid B12 deficiency and or the need for another medication or another supplement um, to potentially manage a, a potential side effect there. So metformin, PPIs, H2 blockers. Uh, the last specific medication, prescription medication I wanted to mention was colchizine. So this is used in, in gout flares. I've, I've done a podcast on, on this medication as well as the others um, in the past. Um, but if you know a, a patient is taking chronic colchizine, um, that could potentially lead to uh, B12 deficiency. Now, if somebody gets it for three days uh, for an acute, you know, five days, seven days for an acute gout flare, um, you know, probably not something I'm going to worry about too much uh, as far as B12 deficiency. But again, chronic use, uh, I'm definitely going to be uh, paying a little bit closer attention. And if they're obviously displaying some symptoms that could be um, related to, to B12 deficiency. And lastly, uh, not necessarily a, a medication per se, um, but I do want to mention alcohol. So, you know, heavy alcohol use uh, does and is associated uh, with B12 deficiency. So um, patients who have a history of alcoholism, often you'll see uh, these patients on B12 supplementation uh, to make sure they, they don't get too low there. All right, so that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. If you enjoyed the show, uh, share us with a, a colleague, a friend, student. Um, also, leave a rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening. I'm greatly appreciative to, to those of you who have done so. Uh, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Get that free uh, top 200 study guide. Absolutely no cost to you. We'll also get you updates uh, regarding new new content and things we, we have going on too. Uh, I mentioned, alluded to, um, talking about the prescribing cascade and doing an, a new book uh, surrounding that with, you know, case studies and, and all sorts of uh, medication-related pearls in there. So that'll be coming. Um, obviously, if you're a subscriber at reallifepharmacology.com, uh, you'll get the update on that. And, and I do uh, give a, and I'm planning to uh, give a huge discount once that book is, is released. So as cheap as they'll uh, let me price it, it is usually what I, I try to do initially uh, for the people that uh, are the biggest fans and, and biggest supporters of, of the podcast here. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I'm anticipating that 
oh, maybe in uh, May, June, July uh, 2021. Uh, that's kind of the, the time frame I'm looking at. Uh, if you got comments, suggestions, uh, reach out. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, or you can uh, uh, track me down by email, mededucation101 at gmail.com. All right, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.